we will be reading from, so if you guys want to go to it early, Luke 21, Luke 17, Matthew 9. Those are the three main ones I was given. How much of them we're going to read, you know, only God will determine. But right now, I want to share this example with you. Imagine with me, you're working for a company that takes care of people. And in this company, there's a particular date where in, inspectors are coming. It is scheduled for inspectors to come. And these inspectors have the power to shut your business down or write you up uh, such raving reviews that you end up getting all kind of funding to help you do more than what you're already doing and hopefully help you expand your business even further. Now check it out. This is an example. It's an analogy that the Lord gave to me right before the service. Here you're waiting for the inspectors to come. You have it on the calendar. You're having all kinds of meetings and workshops to make sure everybody is prepared. This is preparation time for the inspection. So everybody goes through. You have certain people assigned to do inventory. You have other people assigned to go around and make sure that it's operating like a well-oiled machine. You're checking everybody's attire, their appearance, the way they carry themselves. You're making sure your best workers will be there on the day and your worst workers will be held off until all inspection is done. Now, your best workers have the best language. They have the best self-control. When they get an attitude, they are very good at camouflaging and not showing it. They're good at keeping their language clean. They don't use cuss words, not even casual cuss words. They're very, very meticulous in getting their work done. They're very punctual. They're very efficient, right? And they're very sanitary. So they make your company look good. Now, you know inspection day is coming. So you make sure that all your supplies are top notch. You're using the best of everything. You're, everything that needs to be fixed is getting fixed. Listen, everything that needs to be fixed is getting fixed that you may not have touched for a year. You may have let slide and deal with all kinds of malfunctions for months and months and maybe even a year or two. But this is inspection day. So you know everything has to be on top of its game, including your business, everything about it. You can't have a shortage of this. You can't run out of toilet paper. You can't run out of diapers. You can't run out of medical supplies. You can't run out of of uh, ink for your inkjet. I mean, you have got to have everything top running because the inspectors are coming. They're going to make sure there are no fingerprints on the wall. They're going to make sure the floors is, are the floors are meticulous. They're going to make sure everything is spotless. All right. And these guys are tough when they come and grade you. So what are you going to do? You're going to do everything in the world to make sure this thing is working beautifully. Now, they're coming on a particular day or they're coming on a day of a particular week because they don't want you knowing exactly when they're coming. They want to catch you by surprise. So you have to be on top of your game the whole time, more than normal, right? Now, here's the difference. That may work for a business, and that's great. But it won't work for God unless, unless you're doing it as a permanent fix. This isn't just for the inspection. This isn't just for when Jesus comes and splits the skies. It's not for that day. This is because 
you know you need to up your game and you see where you fall short. You're drawing close to God. You're reading his word. You're comparing yourself to his word. You're cleaning up your act. You're doing everything you can to give God your excellence, your best. You're cleaning up your language. You're cleaning up your, your attitude through prayer. You're washing yourself in the word of God. You're constantly getting more and more in filling of your Holy Spirit. So you are fully equipped. You're using all the spiritual warfare. You're going to God with honesty and truth, transparency, and confessing whatever you need to confess so that he can heal whatever needs healing. He can deliver you from whatever you need deliverance from. And you are doing everything in the world to get your act together because you know this is an eternal weight of glory that you're trying to qualify for. And you know the only way you can qualify is to be in Christ Jesus, right? All right. So my question to you is what are you doing during, as my friend Patty says, what are you doing during this time out for God's people? What are you doing during this time of, 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 of stillness, this time of isolation? What are you doing with your time? What are you getting from the Lord? What are you giving to the Lord? What are you doing for the Lord? What are you seeking him for? What are you doing? Are you getting deeper into his word? Are you seeking his face, his heart, his, his whole being to permeate yours? What are you doing? Are you washing yourself in his presence? Are you washing yourself through his word? Are you cleaning up your act, your language, your behavior? What are you doing with all this free time you've got? The reason I ask you that is because when inspection day comes, when Jesus comes and splits the sky, that's not just going to be a temporary fix where you get more funding and you get more equipment and they really write you up uh, glorious reviews so that you can get all this extra help. No, this is eternal. There's no guarantee. If the inspection comes and you have a major earthquake, your whole thing can crumble in one minute. But when Jesus comes, and you get a positive review from him. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's an eternal weight of glory. That stands throughout eternity. But if, if when he comes, you are found wanting, you're found neglecting, you're found straddling the fence, you're found, as he calls, lukewarm, he will spew you out of his mouth. And that is eternal as well. It's called perdition. Perdition is another word for eternal damnation, doom, hell, the whole nine yards. All right. Knowing that this inspection is way more weighty than a business inspection, how much more should you be reaching high? How high should you raise your bar? Don't, imit, don't just mark the perfect man and behold the upright for the end of that man is peace. That's great. Mark and behold Jesus himself. That is your ultimate model of holiness, character, fruits of righteousness, love, compassion, boldness, authority, power. That's your ultimate. Mm, okay. Now, I'm going to read now. Luke chapter 17. I want you to go there with me. 
verse 22 and on. The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, see here or see there, go after, go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wise. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Wake up, you guys. This is not the time to, to play footsies under the table when Jesus is getting ready to bust the clouds. Now, the reason I'm making this urgent is because I have never been given so many scriptures at one time for a message about Jesus' coming. But I have a feeling we're going to get a lot of this in the next couple of weeks or so, if we're still here. All right. Now, let me continue to read. Likewise, verse 28, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. You notice the common denominator, both 27 and both 29, and destroyed them all. Wow. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he shall be, he, let me read that again, verse 31. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Now, you know some of these apocalyptic movies that we've been watching lately? And yeah, we've all been watching them. You notice how a lot of them get destroyed or killed early because they're running back trying to get this, trying to get that, trying to grab that equipment instead of getting their behinds out of Dodge. I watched a movie about six months ago where these people were studying volcanoes. And the reason they died was because when the helicopter was coming, they were so busy grabbing up this expensive equipment instead of hightailing it up there so when the helicopter came, they could jump on and get up out of Dodge. As a result, they all died from the lava because they waited too long getting stuff. Now, what I say to you is don't get hung up in these last days on your image, on your business, on your houses, your belongings, your money. There may come a day where you got to leave it all and God says, go here or go there. You better go. Don't reach back for your keys. Don't reach back for your wallet. Trust God for provision. But you better go. You better be ready. What did they do the night when the Egyptians, wow, I'm not really sure where this is going, so I'm really following God blind on this one. What did they do the night the Egyptians were, were plagued 
on their firstborn. The Israelites, when they did that Passover, when they had the blood on the lentils, on their door, on their doorpost, and they're in the houses and they're eating bitter herbs and they're eating in haste. The Bible says they had to eat in haste with their shoes on, which meant as soon as they got sustenance in their body and the plague was over, they had to hightail it on out of there. They didn't have time to pack more things. Whatever they hadn't packed, they better leave behind. Time to go. They didn't have time to run around saying goodbye to everybody. They had to hightail it out of there. Now, what I'm saying to you is we have no idea what's coming. We read things in the Bible. We read the stories. We, we you know, see the similitudes and the... We see all the little pictures that God gives us to give us an example of how urgent things are going to be. But my question to you is how attached to stuff and people are you? Some of you silly women, it's coming to me right now, some of you silly women will be reaching back for some boyfriend that could care less about you or God. And you will miss out on where God's taking you because you're so busy trying to get him to come along with you because you can't live without him. Sure you can. Right. Now, there are things that we value in this life we better cut off of us now. You better disengage and get yourself severed in your heart and in your spirit because there are going to be people and things, things that you treasure here on earth that you better stop treasuring. I'm not saying don't love. I'm saying don't worship it. You have got to get rid of every sin and every weight that would so easily beset you and run with patience this race set before you. You have to reach toward the mark of the high calling of God. You got to reach. You got to stretch. You got to press in. You got to push. You got to fight. You got to kick and scream at times to make sure that you are determined to head in the right direction. Because this last day is not going to have a second chance at inspection. You better pass the inspection when he splits the sky. You better be ready. All right, so that means you got to clean up your act, you got to clean up your lip, you got to clean up your attitude, you got to clean up your entertainment sources, you got to clean up, I mean, get everything in order. Line up, straighten up, and fly right. Some of you haven't heard that old song of some of us old folks. Straighten up and fly right. All right, now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 9. This is where we have to get busy about God's business. We not only have to straighten up our act, but we have to go to work. When it's inspection time, you can't be sitting on the couch talking about, I'm not coming in today. You got to be at work. You got to be there presentable, being about your, your business that you are supposed to be doing when the inspectors come. Because they're not only inspecting things, they're inspecting the workers. And God will be doing all of the above. So what does he say in Matthew chapter 9? Let me start at 36 so you can get it in, co in context. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then said he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, 
Some of you are good at writing. Some of you are good at speaking. Some of you are good at singing. When was the last time you strolled your little hiney hips over to a convalescent home and sang songs of comfort? Or led the whole group, if you don't have a solo voice, led the whole group in singing songs of worship? Or just played songs of worship so you could all chime in with the music? When was the last time you went to hospitals, convalescent homes, or prisons and prayed for the inmates, prayed for the patients, sat and just talked to them? When was the last time you sought out those outreach ministries that most people don't even think about? Hmm? When was the last time you wrote letters to inmates, letters of comfort and encouragement? When was the last time you wrote letters to widows that you knew were alone, didn't have any family, and put a little check inside of it too? Put a little something, something in there to help them out. When was the last time you offered to take one of your neighbors to lunch and just fellowship, develop relationship? And let God lead as you take them two or three times in a row into the witness as it just develops through conversation, not force feeding, not gagging them with the gospel, just a nice mellow love talk. When was the last time it dawned on you to do something like that? When was the last time in the wintertime you gathered up blankets and drove out to the homeless and gave them blankets and and, and, and waterproof bed, uh, uh, sleeping bags so they could sleep in, in all these weird weather conditions. When was the last time that it even dawned on you? And if you're afraid, you could have gone with a group, but when was the last time that came to your mind? See, body of Christ, we need to wake up and stand with God. We need to ask God, what can I put my hands to do? You can't walk, but you can talk. Hmm? You don't have money, but you got honey right here in your heart. You love God's people. Some people just need to be loved, y'all. Sit on the porch with them and just rock back and forth and chit-chat with them. Bring over some, some goodies and just sit with them and talk. Keep them company. You don't have to be talking Jesus the whole time. You can be the example. Be the example of love. Be the example of friendship, companionship. Meet them at their need, not yours. Think about it. See, there's so much we could be praying to God during this time out, right? We can be asking God, Lord, give me all kind of witty inventions. Give me all kind of ideas. What can I be doing for you? What more can I do? He's not looking for you to weigh yourself out for him. He's not looking for, for slave labor. He just wants you to want to serve him. It's not that God hasn't called you. It's that you're too caught up with me, myself, and I. Me, my four, and no more. And when you're caught up with your own life, you can't see the needs of others when it's all about you. Some of the things you're struggling with will go away. It'll lose its hold on you when you become others-minded. When you reach out and touch others, reach out and touch somebody's hand. Listen, we gotta, oh, a lot of us don't get what we have to offer because we see ourselves as grasshoppers. But I'm going to tell you something. If, if I were living on the street, check this out. If I was living on the street and some little kid, some little kid hasn't made any accomplishments in life, doesn't know jack about life, walking down the street, sees me curled up in a cardboard box and they feel sorry for me and their mommy just gave them $10, two $5 bills. 
And that little kid walks over to me and hands me one of those $5 bills. To me, that's going to be like a million bucks. That kid, they don't know how to drive. Kid, they might not even know how to read yet. Think about this. Think about this. But what little that child had, they were willing to share. What little do you have that you're willing to share for God's sake, for the kingdom's sake? God has put gifts in our hands. What are we doing with the gifts? Sitting on them? Using them when it's convenient? Hmm? Have you presented those gifts to God and said, Lord, what will thou have me to do with this, that, and the other? Hmm. These are the last days. It's, it's countdown time. It's time out for being a couch potato. It's time out for spending wee hours on the phone, yakety yakking and yakety yakking. Yakety yak, yakety yak. Don't go back. Come on now. There's more to life than what's happening in your at your front porch. There's more to life than what you're having for dinner. There's more to life than whether you had a boo boo today or not. There's more to life than if you had an argument with your wife or your husband and what it was about. There's more to life than, than squeezing the toothpaste from the middle. I mean, we get so caught up in the nee 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 things of life that we totally lose sight of the forest before us. Mm, help us, Lord. Seek God with all your might. Get your mind off of you. You are not the end all of the universe. There are people out there that need what you already have. Like the little $5 bill from the little kid. You're looking to be able to do great things and be able to do marvelous things and you want to wow the world with your essence. And all you got to do sometimes is something simple, like take somebody's trash out, take them to the store, let them know you're going to the store, you need a ride. Simple little things that could let me share something with you. Thank you, Lord. I forgot about this. You know, when we get saved, there are certain things we don't do in our houses. We don't, we don't screw, we don't chew, we don't smoke, we don't blow, we don't do any of that, and we don't hang out with those that do. So none of that's going to cross our threshold. Well, let me share this with you. This woman had a horrible thing happen in her life. I don't remember the detail, but it's a true story. And she was torn apart. She was beside herself and in, in sorrow and in mourning and heaviness. And she was at her wit's end. And she just needed somebody to listen. So the only person she could think of was this Christian woman the whole apartment complex knew, you don't smoke in that woman's house. Oh, you better not. She'll get you told. But this woman, when she saw the heaviness on this woman's face, to show you how important love is, the woman may not have been able to sing. The woman may not have been able to preach. The woman may not have written book number one. The woman may not have been able to do much of anything. But she had two ears and a heart. Her ears gave themselves to the woman who needed somebody to listen. She had a box of Kleenex. 
The woman needed Kleenex. Then she marched in the kitchen because the woman totally forgot. And, and her normal thing was when she got bent out of shape, she'd light up her cigarette. And the woman went in the kitchen and brought a dessert dish because she had no ashtrays. She didn't tell her, babe, you got to put out that, that mm -mm, no, 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 you got to put out the, the cigarette. No, she brought something for her to dump her ashes in because she knew that what the woman was going through was way more important than whether she wanted smoke in her house or not. And she sat there and let that woman pour her heart out. And if I remember correctly, she ended up over time giving her heart to the Lord because of the love that woman showed her. That woman didn't chastise her about, you know, we don't smoke, we don't chew, we don't hang out with those. Who do. She didn't go into any of that. It wasn't about her. She let it be about the woman who needed her. And she made her as comfortable as she could make her. And that woman sat there and puffed away and bawled her eyes out, puffed away and, 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 and vented and did everything she needed. Then the woman offered to pray for her. And she hugged her. That woman needed love and compassion more than anything else. She didn't even need a witness at that time. At that moment, what she needed was compassion. And that's what she gave. As a result of her example of love and compassion, the woman gave her heart to the Lord eventually. It wasn't an overnight success. Okay, I sealed the deal before I let her out the door. No, but she followed up and followed up and before you knew it, bam, it happened naturally. What are you willing to give? I know this is a weird message. I just, it ain't a hooping message that's going to have you jumping up and down, you know, waiting for God to pour out his, his blessings of money and this, that, and the other, and just bless you and prosper you. No, this ain't no prosperity message. But does it matter to you what God wants of you? Does it matter? Okay. Father, I ask you to open our eyes to what you want us to do. Open our eyes to recognize opportunity every single time, all day long, whether we're at the store, whether we're at the gas station, whether we're at the convenience store, wherever we are, let us be willing to reach out when we see a need. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Help us, Father, to pass inspection when you split the clouds. And I want to hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Oh, God. And I want to hear you say, enter in. Oh, help us, Father. Have a heart of compassion. Let us be motivated by love of others more than love of self. Let us be motivated by love of you, by gratitude. Help us, Father. Forgive us for sin and fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Baptize us in your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would send laborers. We pray, Lord of the harvest that you would send forth laborers into your harvest, into your vineyard, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, give me a second, y'all. Let me stop the recording.